Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. There's a couple things that I noticed about uh, that particular video. There's two things that stood out. One was obvious, and it was the word family. It's like family. We hear that so often. Um, that family came and it just felt like home to them. And so um, that's God's intention in the first place, right? Romans 8 chapter, the scripture says about family, it says, you didn't receive, whenever we received Christ, it says that the spirit of adoption came to us. We didn't receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. When we became a part of a, uh, when we said yes to the Lord, we became a part of a family. We received the spirit of adoption as sons or daughters, Uh, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Ephesians, the fifth chapter, goes on to say this about family. It says that it was always in God's perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children. He didn't want to leave us orphans, isolated there by ourselves in a deserted place. It's through our union with Jesus, for the same love that he has for his beloved son or beloved one, Jesus, he has for every single one of you. And this unfolding plan, this plan about family, and how he wanted the family to be a part, that, that brings him great pleasure is what the scripture says about that. Amen? Amen? And so this freedom that we have in him, and it's just a powerful, powerful. And one thing about Natalie and I, we're passionate about um, you walking in the freedom that God has given to you in him. I mean, that's something that occupies our hearts. We see people sometimes that are downtrodden and they're desperate and they're in despair and they're just discouraged and they're, they're downcast. And, we, and we're just so thankful that God can trust us with those individuals. It doesn't scare me. I'm not pushed back by that. I just know that God uh, desires for them to be out of that place and into a place of freedom where they're standing strong. And so that's our desire and that's our DNA and that's your DNA as well. Whenever you come in here, you'll notice it's like, well, those are strange people. Those are different looking people here, but there's a reason why they're here. There's a reason why you're here. You were just like that too, weren't you? I know you guys, y'all are a mess. And then now y'all are, y'all, I'm just looking at this section over here. Sorry, I don't know who y'all are. Hey man, how's it going? Nate, and I hadn't seen you in a while, but anyways, Nate was all messed up. His wife was worse off. <clears throat> but I, I love to see the transformation, like the, the Frank and these guys that were leading us in worship, Jeremy Swick. Man, these guys, I'm telling you, their story is powerful. And they got out of that place. And it is our desire to see people to be free in their marriage, to be free from, you know, the fear and the stuff that just bound them up when they were uh, walking on their own. Freedom, walking without fear, walking without shame. Freedom that they, they could just laugh and, and, and enjoy life and laugh at themselves and, and moving forward. So that's part of what we do. And it was always God's plan in the beginning for us to walk in freedom. Yes. He always had that. Remember with Adam and Eve? It says that he was with them and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they weren't ashamed. I don't know about you, but that seems like freedom to me. Being naked and not ashamed. They remind me of like empty nesters. Whenever you don't, they didn't have any kids and they were just by themselves and they just had a little bit less clothing on. Okay, and they were free to just walk around. And any empty nesters here, you understand what I'm talking about, right? Uh, that's all I got to say. But we were empty nesters for a little bit, and then now we're, you know, occupied ourselves with the, our grandson now, which is fantastic, but we have all our clothing back on again. <laughs> and so, so there was always God's intention for us to be in freedom and not be ashamed of anything. Amen? And one thing about freedom is this, though. The freedom that Christ has given us, we're also, if we wanted to, we can relinquish that. We can give that freedom up. And that's exactly what took place with Adam and Eve. They relinquished the freedom that God had given them. The serpent came in and deceived them by questioning God's word. Has God indeed said that? And you know, he's always, and and, and God the Father told them, he goes, hey, listen, because you've listened to someone else's words rather than my words, the result is slavery. The, the result is having a more difficult life. The, the result is work and toil, and you're gonna be straining constantly. And that's exactly what the result was. Captivity, hiding, secrets, blaming. When you take a look at Adam and Eve's life right afterwards, right after when they relinquished that, man, they were in deep bondage, right? But God's plan never changed. He still wants uh, to be free, us to be free and walk in that freedom. And so he created a plan. He sent his son 
to come down onto this earth and to lead us out of captivity and back to the original freedom that uh, was his intention that was in his heart for all of his people. And when Jesus came in on the scene and he started the ministry, that's exactly how he started. He says, hey, let me just give you a frame, a, a reference here. He goes, this is who I am. This is who the Father is. And this is what we are all about. So he gave us his purpose when he goes into the church and he takes the book from Isaiah and he begins to minister God's word and God's intention and his purpose for all of us. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to send me to heal those that were brokenhearted. To, set, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's his intention. As a matter of fact, 1 John, the scripture says, for this purpose the Son of Man came, that he might destroy the works of the enemy. The works of the enemy was to keep you in bondage, to keep you in fear, to keep you a distance from this God who wants to just see you walk in his freedom. He came to destroy that type of work. John, the eighth chapter, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees who were misrepresenting who his father was. And he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he also goes on to say, and the Apostle Paul noticed and recognized that, hey, when the Spirit of the Lord is, so all of a sudden we receive, we embrace Jesus, the Spirit of Christ comes on the inside of us. And the Scripture says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty. And so we, we yield ourselves, we, we desire to yield and lend ourselves to the Spirit of God as we're walking into this place, as we're getting ready for services, because where the Spirit of God is, we just believe that there's freedom. And only God can take someone who is in shackles and in chains and in slavery and set them free. So we just believe that while you guys are worshiping, while you guys are listening to the Word of God, there are angels, there are things that are just walking through these aisles and they're just touching you where you need to be touched encouraging you. We've seen people walk out of this place on drugs, just fully just messed up, and, and, you know, on dope, walk out of this place just free. And we didn't do anything with it. Jesus came in. We desire and we believe that God, as long as we're obeying him and sharing his word and sharing his love and expressing the love of God through us, we believe that God's going to do that work. We can't change anyone anyways. And so that's who we are, and that's what God wants to do in our lives. And spiritual freedom, that can happen anywhere. It can, it's not only going to happen in the church. It can happen in any location. doesn't matter where it is. For us, it happened in a living room in a, a government housing on, on, manor, on uh, manor Apartments there by 123. We were so messed up, but it was that Saturday morning he walks to that place, the same filthy, ungodly, unholy place in that living room and just came and exploded inside that place. And man, we were forever changed since we were 19 years old. And we loved the freedom that we have. It was a whole lot better walking in freedom than it is in bondage. Uh, you know, we were tired of fighting. I was tired of getting beat up by Natalie. It was, it was hard. I'm just facetious, but actually we did have a whole bunch of fights. There were so many ungodly things that we did that we're, I'm just ashamed of many of them. And I have a lot of regrets of what took place, in, took place in, that, in that season of our lives. But he still saw, he, he showed his mercy towards us. And he came into that place. And it doesn't have to be in a church. Sometimes it does happen. This is what we call the living room. Many times it does happen. Many of you experience uh, the living room experience and, and God's freedom in, into this place. We've seen marriages that were on the brink of divorce walk out of this place just restored because the the love of God came in and the, the, the power to forgive all of a sudden just came. But the Apostle Paul, that took place while he was on his way to go persecute Christians. The prodigal son, that freedom took place in a pig pen. There's a woman who was at the, a, a well and uh, the freedom came to her at that place. There's another woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, right in the middle of all this darkness, and it was at that place that God showed himself strong and freed her from and delivered her from that bondage, amen? So it doesn't matter. All I know, want you to know, if you're even thinking about who this God is and who this Jesus is, just call upon him. Lord, show me. Prove yourself to me. You can even say that if you want to. And God, he will in no wise cast out those who are trying to draw close to him. He'll, you'll experience the freedom that we've experienced and that many people have experienced all over the world. And that's why we're here in this church. That's why we're here in this community to share this same love that was given to us freely to those who are still seeking. 
Because I don't know about you, whenever I'm driving and I see people's faces and I'm looking at, I mean, I just, you can see that they're not in, in that place of freedom. That they are just, there's a stronghold in their thinking, in their imaginations, in their walk, in their life, with their family, with their friends. I mean, you see, I see a lot of stuff in here. And uh, we've experienced it ourselves. But nevertheless, the, the, the heart cry and the mercy of my father is to, to show himself strong on behalf of those who are just willing to give him that little inch. And if you're here this morning and you're in that brink where you're brokenhearted and you're in misery and you're just tired of where you're at, man, I'm telling you, just look up. You don't need to hang your, sh- your head in shame any longer. All you have to do is just, just open up your heart just a little bit and say, God, I need you. God, I want freedom in this place. And I'm sh- telling you, God will show himself on your behalf. And that's who he is, amen? amen. I love this church because we are passionate for freedom in people's lives. And so this morning, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to share a passage of scripture in you that I feel best describes who Crossroads Church is, best describes who we are in our story as a couple who God has called us into this place. If I knew that we would be doing this years later, I would have run the exact opposite direction. Because to stand before people as, as, as an adult and to talk to people about him or is just like, that is not in my DNA. I, like, I was a little kid who went to Weinert School and I was a wild cat and I played by myself on the sand with my own little cars. And when there was a big crowd, I was, ang- I was anxious. I, was, I had all kinds of anxiety. And all of a sudden he calls me out of this dark place to go and preach the gospel. I was like, Really? <laughs> But there's a story in Mark, the fifth chapter that describes, it's, it's a story about the demoniac who Jesus healed. We were in Israel traveling a couple years ago doing this trip. And the exact place, it was the Gadarenes, the location, we were on this other place called uh, Magdala. And that's where Mark, after, Mark chapter five, where the woman with the issue of blood was touched the hem of his, his garment, was made whole. We were at that place. And across that place is the Sea of Galilee. And right in front of it is the Sea of Galilee. And across was where this story took place. So I'm very familiar. When I'm reading this story, I'm thinking about the scenery that I was, I actually saw with my own physical eyes. We'll see it right here in Mark chapter five, verses one through 20. It says, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes, which by the way, that word means, the Gadarenes means there's a reward at the end. I thought that was interesting. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him someone out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. That unclean spirit, it's, it's kind of twofold when you think about it. Unclean because it's ceremonially unclean because of what he was doing, how he's conducting himself. He couldn't be around individuals, but it was also unclean in thought. And like there's always an open door. Uh, whenever you get into this place of bondage and, and you're all messed up, you, you have to open up a door. The demons and the devil and the enemy is always looking for a willing vessel that opens up a door so he can have an entrance. And these demons, these things, they have to occupy bodies in order for them to sustain themselves. And so all of a sudden, this guy opened himself up and he was so messed up and so in bondage and so in slavery and so chained and shackled that he was out here among the tombs. A man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him. And not even with chains. I mean, it was so bad, he was so horrible and so, you know, manic that they tried to chain him up to keep him grounded, to keep him from hurting himself or hurting others. But the chains couldn't even uh, bind him because he had been so often bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. Have you ever been so dark and so in bondage that no one No one, even the closest friends uh, who has any entrance into your life, no one could do anything about it. Anybody ever been there? I mean, your dad, your mom, your wife, your children come up to you and goes, Dad, could you just please change? We stop hitting mom or whatever that is. And you wouldn't listen. Anybody ever been there? Man, I've been there. Where mom, my wife was saying, look in the mirror, can't you see? And I'm like, I can't see anything. You're the problem. My, 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 my parents, people in authority, my coaches, my teachers, Avalos, what's wrong with you? It's like, what's wrong with you? You're the problem, sir. Leave me alone. 
And this is how this guy was. Nobody could bind him. No one could do anything about it. I've been there. And always, night and day, it goes on. Uh, He was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. That's one thing about darkness. When you get, when you, when you get occupied by unclean spirits and, and stuff that's, you're so in the dark that you opened up the door for all this stuff to start manifesting itself in your life and through your life. And, and, you're, and, and you're crying out when I was in my worst case. And um, I, I remember going to places by myself just so I could scream. I wanted freedom and I couldn't get that freedom because I would, I, I would think that there's my freedom. And it would entice me and I would go after it because like, this, if I just do this, I'll be free. But it actually took me further and further in bondage. When, whenever you're in that place and it's so difficult, it's so dark, man, you're crying out on the inside and you don't know what else to do. As a matter of fact, you cry out so much that you, 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 you begin to hurt yourself. You begin to do things in your life. You begin to harm yourself. And all you're trying to do is you're trying to find a way to, to, to satisfy that, that, that stuff that's on the inside. And the, the emotions that are going on, it's so, you so want out of that place. And sometimes you just got to do something physically to try to express those deep, dark emotions that you're feeling and that pain and that, just, that stuff that's going on on the inside of you. And as you would hurt yourself. And so I, I remember looking at my, my arm one day, this is one day, just sitting there, just rolled up my sleeve and I counted 47 needles, 47 holes in my arm. Just one day because I was so deep in this dark place and these things occupied me so much and I thought that this was the way out and I said, well, I'm just gonna do another one and then I'm just gonna go, you know, just go for it. Now maybe I'll be free now. And it wouldn't work. I would get deeper and deeper in darkness and more depressed and more discouraged. And I hated myself so much that I just said, I'm just going to hurt myself even more. And that was just a cycle over and over in my life. It was so miserable. So I understand exactly what this man was going to. I wasn't in a tomb, even though I went to the tombs. It's like, man, this is my place right here. This is what I want to occupy. Because I'd rather be here than going through what I'm going through mentally. And so he was so dark that he was in that place and he was crying out and he was cutting himself with stones. Some of you guys know people in your own house, some of you guys might be there right now where it's so miserable and it's so dark in your life that you just want to just call it quits. You just want to end it. And I'm here to tell you, if you're in there in this place, you can't do that because Jesus wants you free. It's just so happens. It just so happens that when we're in that place, we think that this is the way out. And this is just another deception that the enemy gives because this is what you need to do and, and you wind up doing that because you want to be free and it winds up leading you into another bondage. This is the relationship I need because if I just hold on, if I just get her, if I just get him, if I just get that job and you realize that that's not, that's not the end, that's not the beginning of your freedom, that actually leads you into more, that leads you more astray. And so this guy was there cutting himself up with stones but when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. There's a major battle that goes on on the inside. There's a, there's a place, your true self, you want to be so free. And when you go to a church or when you hear about God, there, there's, the, the Spirit of God is always constant. He's not willing that anyone perish, but that all would come to a place of repentance. And he's constantly drawing us to himself. He'll use people. He'll use jobs. He'll use music. He'll use whatever he needs to use to draw you to himself. And that's what you really want. That's what you really crave for. All of a sudden you hear that. And then and, and this guy hears and sees Jesus from afar. He runs towards him. Why? Because he wants to be free. <clears throat> but whenever you are pursuing the things of God, that's when the battle begins. I remember so many times, man, I would walk catty corner to my house. And there was a Catholic church there. And at that time they would be open 24 hours. And I would get my little three-year-old daughter and I'd walk into that church and I'd just walk around hoping that somebody was in there to talk to me because I wanted deliverance so bad. I wanted to be a better dad. I wanted to be a better father. I wanted to be a better uh, husband. But I didn't know how to do it. So I was like, man, the church has got to be the place. I know there's a God. There's someone who made me. And I desire this. I crave this. And I'd walk in that church hoping somebody's there. No one was there. No one ever shared the gospel of Jesus Christ to me. And I'd go back and I'd be so frustrated, I'd just keep doing the thing again. And I'd walk by a creek or drive by a creek and I'd take all my needles and I'd throw it in the creek. Like, this is it. This is the last time I'm doing this. 
only to wake up in the middle of the night at three, three or four in the morning, get a flashlight, and go right back into that creek to look for him. Because this thing was just, the battle began. And that's exactly, those things on the inside just started stirring up and they'll always try to drive you back because the ultimate plan for the enemy is to kill you, to destroy you, to ultimately just put you out of misery. But that's not God's plan. He wants freedom for you, Jeremy. He wants freedom for every single one of us. He wants you to live a long, long life on this earth till you're satisfied, till you're able to tell your children and your grandchildren, hey, look to God because he's the answer, Amen. And this guy right here, after he cut himself, it says that he saw Jesus from afar and he ran to go worship him. And then all of a sudden the battle begins and he cried out with a loud voice saying, what have I to do with you, Jesus, the son of the most high God? The demon started stirring up and started creating confusion. I implore you by God that you do not torment me. He goes, please leave me alone in this place. I've been here a while. I like this vessel right here. Because for he said to himself, come out. Jesus had said, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And so all of a sudden, there's a higher authority. These guys have been in authority for so long, occupying this body and this open vessel. And all of a sudden, someone who is higher in authority comes in and speaks and says, come out of him. Go ahead, Mike. And they asked him, then he asked him, what's your name? And he said, my name's Legion, for we're many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. He's talking about the demons now. It seems like it's this man, but it's these things occupying inside of him. Now, a large herd of swine, he goes, I don't want to, I, I need a body to occupy. I, the, the enemy needs someone that's open in a vessel so he can occupy inside of them. So a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. And so all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. He goes, there's a body there. It doesn't matter if it's an animal or another human. He goes, there's someone that's alive. Send me into those things. And so what did Jesus say? Nothing. <laughs> and at once, Jesus gave them permission. And so those unclean spirits, they had to obey. They went out and entered the swine. There's about 2,000 of them, the scripture says. And the swine were smarter than the guy. It's like, man, I don't want you occupying me. So they just violently ran down the steep place and the sea, and they drowned in the sea. And that, you know, death is the ultimate result. Uh, whether you're an animal or whether you're human, the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. And so that's exactly what took place. The swine, it's like, man, I don't want to be occupied by you. They kind of freaked out. They didn't have the power to restrain themselves like we do. And all of a sudden, the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now, notice what happens after that. It says that there are individuals, go ahead, Mike, individuals who saw. There are those who had fed the swine. They fled. Individuals saw all that happened. They took off. Like, I would have took off too. Like, what the heck's going on? These are my pigs. And they told it in the city and in the country. Actually, he went back to a Decapolis area, which is like 10 cities around. They began to share this, this story, what they just experienced. And they went out to see what, was, what had happened. I always wondered, I wonder what part of the story did they tell? Did they tell the part of the story of the, of the, of the, the demoniac man, or did they tell the part of the story about the swine? It didn't matter, but I'm just saying, I wonder what they emphasized. And they went out to the sea, um, what had happened. And then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion. I mean, this guy, everybody knew about this guy. They knew that he was isolated out into another place, that no one could chain him, no one could restrain him. And all of a sudden, they see this same guy sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. They freaked out. I'm telling you, whenever you see the power of God work in an individual's life, and you see him transform from darkness to light, it scares people. They freak out. Like that's impossible to take place. When Natty and I gave our life to Christ, I mean, I'm telling you, the police freaked out because they were seeing us. We were on surveillance. Everywhere I went, they were following me. They were about to arrest me. And from one Saturday to the next, this guy changed. Like what the heck happened? They told me afterwards, I had the guy who was overseeing this whole project. And they, they said, man, what happened to you, dude? He goes, we noticed all of a sudden you changed. Something happened. And I got to share the gospel message with them. 17 of my friends were indicted. Some of them are still in prison. Uh, many of them have died already. But God, for whatever reason, rescued me out of that place and set me free that Saturday morning. He goes, they saw him clothed in his right mind. He goes, did you hear about Mark? 
dude, what the heck? And I had friends coming up to me and saying, Mark, what's wrong with you, man? It's like, I don't know. I said, all I know is that whatever came from this book, that's what I needed. I got to find out what's in this book. You want to help me read it? No, man, I got to go. And they kind of freaked out this whole thing. But I had friends, I had people, my parents freaked out. I don't know what they thought about it. I haven't asked them, don't want to ask them, but I'm sure they thought they had some thoughts as well. Oh, he's just going through a phase. Who knows? My only friend that I had was my wife and my grandmother, who's now in heaven. But that's all I had because people freak out and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him, who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their regions. Like, dude, I don't know what happened to you, but please get out of here, okay? Maybe this thing's going to come back. And I don't want it to come back on you and me as, as well. Just get out of here. He goes on to say in verse 16 or uh, 18, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him. Can you imagine being tormented and so bound up? All of a sudden, there's just freedom. And the beauty of that freedom, you can't, you can't put it into words. Just like what Jesus said, when you're born again, you know the wind is there, but you don't know where it's coming from. You, don't, you can't grasp it, but you know that it's real. It's like this guy is walking in perfect peace, perfect harmony, the way God intended it in the very beginning. And it says the individual who's demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. And that's exactly what takes place. When you're free and God sets you free, it's like, I, I just want to know this guy. Who, who is this person in this book? I just want to thank him. I just want to love on him. I want to embrace him. I want to find out who he is because what he's offered me is exactly what I need. And I've got to share this with other people, but I don't know what to share because I don't know what happened. I wasn't looking for him. He came to me that Saturday morning. And he says, Jesus, though, he says, man, can I just go with you? I need to know more about you. And Jesus didn't permit him, though. He didn't permit him. Why? Because God knows exactly where we need to be and what our mission is in life. Oh, I'm sure it would have been great for him to occupy that time with Jesus in that season. But he said this. He says, rather than, than going with me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back home to your friends. Because they're friends that were meddling around in the same stuff you were meddling around. They just hadn't gone that deep. I want you to go back to those same individuals. Why? Because just as much love as I have for you, I have for them. And I need you to be bold and courageous enough. Even though you don't know exactly what took place, I just want you to go back and just start sharing what you experienced with me. Show them and tell them how he has had compassion on you. Show them, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, how he has compassion for you. And the young man departed, and he began to proclaim in 10 cities all that Jesus had done for him, and they all marveled. Isn't that powerful? Man, I love that story. It is so powerful. Guys, y'all want to go ahead and come up. And the beautiful thing is that that's what our mission is. When God told us to come back home, we were ready to go anywhere in this world to go and proclaim it. We were empty nesters. We were ready to go anywhere. And the Lord said, I want you to come back home and tell them how much I love you. This experience is so much like this story for us. And so here we are in Seguin, Texas, and here you are in Seguin, Texas. And you're wondering why you're here? Let me tell you why you're here. And, I, and God's going to give you a divine appointment, and that's my prayer, that you get divine appointments. So that when you go back home to your fill-in-the-blank, that you would have courage to sit down and say, hey, listen, can I just talk to you for a minute? I'm not going to try to change you, but here's what I want to tell you. Man, God has been so good to me. He's had so much compassion in my life. And I just want you to know if you ever need, if you're ever reaching out, if you ever need to change, if you ever want something that's, that's more than what you have right now, I'm going to point you in the right direction. And I'm here for you to serve you and to pray for you and to lead you that way as well. Amen. Go back home to your whoever that is and tell them how much God has compassion for you. We're going to close with this song that they said earlier, I've been redeemed. You don't have to stay here. You're more than welcome to. Some of you guys need to just stay here and just soak that in. But that's our calling. That's our mandate. That's who Crossroads Church is, is to tell people how much our God has had compassion on us. And we want to share that same compassion to others. If you are ever in the Seguin area, 
come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.